Hello everyone and uh, welcome to my um, uh, seventh lecture on network system on chapter seven and the topic of this chapter is the study of the um, continuous time averaging systems and specifically uh, that we also refer to as the Laplacian flow. So let me start with uh, an outline for the chapter. Um, as you uh, as you recall, um, in chapters uh, one through five, we looked at a number of examples, um, and then we analyzed them in detail uh, by using in in the context of discrete time uh, uh, dynamics. We had discrete time averaging models and the properties of the adjacency matrix, for example. In chapter six, we then studied um, we then studied the Laplacian matrix, and we started, uh, you know, to which is a preliminary step towards understanding continuous time systems, continuous time averaging systems. So, in this chapter, what I am going to do, I'm going to show you examples. Of the Laplacian flow, which is the main subject of this chapter. So, what is the Laplacian flow? This is a differential equation of the form x dot equal to minus lx, where l is a Laplacian matrix. And we're gonna go, we're, we're gonna, we have looked at an example in chapter one. In chapter one, we looked at the example of flocking, to which I wish to point, point you to as well. But for fun, and also because I think these, instruct, these examples are instructive, I would like to show you three more examples. One having to do with, um, with continuous time, continuous time opinion dynamics. So truly this is um, a continuous time version of the French de Groot um, model of um, um, of opinion dynamics, right, where individuals are exchanging opinions and they're performing local averages. And we'll show how a continuous time flow, uh, a continuous but may arise from that. A second will be an example from an electric circuit. And it, it's a little example, it just shows you also how naturally sometimes asymmetric Laplacians arise, even if the graph that you start with may well be symmetric. And finally, um, I will look at an example of um, one or two examples of, of PDEs. We look at PDEs, we'll look at the Laplacian PDE and the Laplacian operator in the, in the heat uh, PDE, and we will see where does the name Laplacian uh, come from. We'll, we'll look at an example like that. So after that, motivated by that we will we will um, we will study a little bit a little bit of a review essentially of of continuous time ODEs continuous time ODEs tools from that and in particular we will review the notion of matrix exponential which, um, as you recall, is, uh, is a key tool in being able to uh, write out the solution of a continuous time ODE. And we will do our, in a, we will do our convergence theorem. The convergence theorem is the same we saw in chapter two, but now we will see it for continuous time system. So there will be some similarity, right? We're interested in the case where the flow converges to something which is not necessarily just the, ident just the zero value. And then finally, we will actually undertake the study of the Laplacian's flow. So these are, you know, properties of the Laplacian flow. And um, we will, we will, there will be three, three parts or four. We will study, for example, the matrix exponential of a matrix that is minus the Laplacian, something like the exponential of minus L. This will be a critical little step to establish um, strong connections between the continuous time and the discrete time cases. 
uh, we'll do some uh, some um, um, some illustrating calculations an illustrating calculation illustrations uh, via uh, sing singular an illustration for the symmetric case via the case where l is equal to l transpose we can use model decomposition everything is easy i'll just i'll just quickly review what happens there in, in, in components so everything is a little easier and then i will give you the general theorem uh, which is which is going to be i can tell you right now the entirely analogous to the theorem that we saw in uh, chapter five for discrete time averaging and then the last uh, the last uh, i have a, i'll have a, a, just a word or two about a quick appendix on a little example on how to design it's again a uh, it's about the design um, of edge weights in order for a certain Laplace matrix to turn out to be um, um, to have zero column sums, which, as we remember from chapter six, corresponds to having um, to, to the, the directed graph with respect to the edge weight to this new edge weights uh, being uh, weight balanced. All right, so this is an overview of the chapter, chapter seven. Okay, I'm now ready to begin the study of continuous time systems, a continuous time averaging system. And the first thing I wish to do is to show you how naturally these uh, dynamics can arise. In, and I'll, I have done it in chapter one when I discussed the example of flocking. And I, I want to show you three other examples uh, at, at this point in time relatively quickly simple examples illustrations that may motivate everything that follows so as you recall we studied this discrete time averaging dynamics where as you recall again a is non-negative which means that it it is sorry non-negative and a it's raw stochastic so this is a discrete time averaging system now imagine that really what is happening is that the instance of time k and k plus one are are very close to each other so they are parameterized they, they, they really correspond to real times t where t is equal to k times tau and so then of course when i go to k plus one then it's t plus tau so we, i mean and i'm going to soon imagine that tau is a small variable so it's a it's a small positive quantity so I'm imagining now that, you know, I'm, I'm really associating real time to this dynamics uh, that was occurring in discrete time. Moreover, I will assume that the influence weights in the matrix A, remember that the coefficients of A correspond to, AIJ corresponds to how much influence individual I gives to individual J. These weights, these influence weights can be written as a bar ij times tau so the longer is the period of time then the more influence is is um, is accorded so now and this is for the case where i is different from j right so now i'm assuming well the new language i'm going to adopt is that these coefficients aij bar are now contact rates because um you know the longer is the contact the more influence is accorded and so this is well posed for sufficiently small uh, periods of time okay so now what happens in this case i am interested in knowing now what is the change of opinion from time uh, uh, k to time k plus one remembering that this really is corresponding to t plus tau and t hmm? now of course, you just plug in and you obtain a minus identity, which multiplies x k, and then, well, very naturally, uh, this is precise a minus identity. You may want to remember that the Laplacian is equal to diagonal a one n, the out degree minus a. But in this particular case, the matrix is selected to be rho stochastic, and therefore, this is identity minus a. So a minus n a minus identity is minus l so as you see the change in opinion is beginning to look like something that has to do with the laplacian matrix now because of the way we define the off diagonal coefficients aij and 
we're remember in the construction of L, the diagonal entries disappear. So it's only about the off diagonal entries. Then what happens here is that the Laplace matrix L is linear in tau. It's an L bar. It's a rate. It's a contact rate Laplace matrix, which then multiplies tau. With this, uh, with this convention, now I can rewrite the right hand side where I subtract what I divide by tau. And I divide by tau also the left hand side. And so when I do that, I obtain x, x at t plus tau minus x at t divided by tau. So now you see where I'm going, I believe. And it's easy to see that now I can imagine that tau is a small variable, as we were discussing. When I take the limit as tau goes to 0 plus, then I obtain the Laplacian flow equations that I am teaching you about in this in this class. And they, and they correspond. One could argue that perhaps I'm not ready to confirm that, but certainly Abelson wrote this in 1964. So this is a relatively early reference for certainly for continuous time opinion dynamic models, the earliest, possibly one of the earliest, if not the earliest at all, uh, scientists who, who was studying this precise set of ordinary differential equations. And again, what we have learned is that um, the French Harari de Groot model that we've studied in chapter five in the limit when when the the influence coefficients are linear in time and there are really influence rates converges to the behavior of the con of, of the laplacian flow before i leave this topic let me give you some intuition we've seen that the laplacian flow is really a limiting behavior for small increments of influence of the discrete time averaging algorithm but then because of this co the correspondence I would imagine that the behavior of the Laplacian flow is one whereby uh, consensus of, emerges along the solutions under some connectivity assumptions, right? Just like we saw in the past. Perhaps maybe even the same identical connectivity assumptions. But we will see that a periodicity is not uh, required any longer in this new setup. Here's a second example. So. Let me not spend too much time here reminding you of everything. You just saw chapter six, where we saw that if I inject currents in a purely resistive circuit, then I, I have this Laplacian static problem, the Laplacian system, C injected equal to LV. Now, in this um, 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 example here, I am going to assume that this is an RC circuit. So each node has a capacitor connected to ground. And so um, with capacitance CI. And so now if that's the case, then without uh, spending too much time into the constitutive physics, which is very elementary, then what is happening is that the current injected the node is equal and opposite to C times the derivative of the voltage at the node because that's the, 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 the law describing the behavior of an ideal capacitor. And so if I define a diagonal matrix with all of the um, capacitances at each node, then combining the equation we saw uh, in chapter six and this new equation here that I am introducing right now, it's easy to see, then one gets to, um, again, an equation that looks like that. So it's, it's um, minus C inverse L. And, and now what you should realize is that this new equation, this new matrix C inverse L, C is a positive diagonal matrix. I am just scaling. So if you have a, if you have a Laplace matrix L and you pre-multiply it by a diagonal matrix positive, what happens is that this is just scaling the columns of L. It's just scaling the total amount. But it, the sign pattern remains unchanged. And certainly, if you multiply this matrix by 1n on the right, it continues to be 0n because L1n is 0. Pre-multiplied by C inverse makes no difference. And so therefore, what happens is that C inverse L continues to be a Laplacian matrix. Albeit, this time, this is an asymmetric Laplacian matrix because now this C scaling of the columns that maybe breaks the symmetry between the entry Lij and Lji. But the fact that it's now asymmetric and really we're now imagining a directed weighted graph 
that's okay it doesn't matter it still is a laplacian flow now also if you think about the physics of this example um, it is clear that um, current will flow and will rebalance itself until a point such that all of the voltages are equal when all the voltages are equal no more current flows on the network and so in other words physically we're imagining that this also this simple circuit will also converge to a consensus for an asymmetric Laplacian now the next question is and, and the final example is um, that it's also good to connect things right is where does the name Laplacian come from right a, a, a French mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace studied diffusion PDEs and defined the Laplacian operator in the study of diffusion PDEs so what is what is going on here well we have a spatial domain capital um, omega and in this spatial domain there is a there is a variable there is a field a, a u that depends upon time and depends upon the variables x and y right and perhaps it describes the this is a, perhaps a, a, a body a domain of a material and perhaps um, it um, it has a certain temperature at each position and this temperature evolves with time as well and how does this uh, field this temperature field evolve well that's dictated precisely by the heat equation and that is this partial differential equation here where whereby the time derivative of the field at each position it's um, equal to well um, it's equal to if I bring the term to the right hand side C which is a positive coefficient a, a thermal diffusivity which we're going to assume homogeneous and constant times uh, and, and the Laplacian differential operator delta of u and so this Laplacian differential operator is the sum of second partial derivatives so here you see second partial with respect to x plus second partial with respect to y this is standard for those of you who have studied um, um, thermodynamics and, and diffusivity uh, diffusion PDEs and so now the question is if this is well known why does our Laplacian matrix have the name Laplacian how does it relate to the standard well-known Laplacian operator in partial differential equations and the answer to that question starts by imagining that we take our domain capital Omega and we discretize it and we do that by means of a mesh graph which could very well be the intersection between a Cartesian grid as was defined in chapter 3 and the domain itself if the if the node is outside the, the domain we throw it away and we keep the ones that are inside and before I, I, I turn page let me understand let me uh, uh, clarify that now I'm going to use I and J to denote a point in the graph so a point in the graph is described by two indices I and J and I'll do the numbering in such a way that if I increase I by one I'm going to the right if I increase J by one I go up and if I decrease I or decrease J uh, I'm going um, I am overall considering all four neighbors to uh, to the central node IJ so the four neighbors of node ij are i plus minus one j and i comma j plus minus one so let's remember that why is that relevant because uh, one can take the partial differential operator and and, and the continuous field and uh, uh, propose a finite difference approximation of the equation and so if ij are the indices of the of the mesh and if you assume that physically each each of these uh, segments here that I am working with has a length h so that that length is important um, then um, the finite different approximation is well known to be and I'll, I'll well known to be the finest different approximation at ij is well known to be minus four times the value of the field at ij plus the value of the field at the four neighboring nodes so this is uh, minus no, i minus one j i plus one j i y j minus one i j plus one so you look at the four positions around the central node and 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 this is the 
find a difference approximation and of course one needs to uh, divide by h square now uh, this is the correct expansion for a point in the interior of the grid and i am not going to worry about writing equivalent uh, uh, formulas for the boundary points because uh, because it's they're irrelevant they're, they're too much detail for what we need but the point is that if you look at it um, this exact operation in this equation star in discrete uh, in discrete space corresponds precisely to the Laplacian matrix of the mesh graph pre-multiplied by c h square or in such a way where all of the edges are given a weight equal to c divided by h square how do we know that well that's um, uh, remember that uh, lx was something along the line the ith entry of lx this is the useful calculation we did in chapter six was equal of the sum under j running from one through n of um, a i j x um j minus x i if memory serves me right perhaps i have a plus or minus sign wrong but that's okay and so out of this equation uh, this equation star literally you can just read out that these are the four neighbors one two three and four right and the coefficient that pre-multiplies each one of them is one divided by h square and then there's an extra c which is the diffusivity coefficient from the previous slide and so to um to complete this story uh, if i let u discrete denote the vector of uh, the the I'm approximating my field with the vector u discrete, then it turns out that the um, diffusion PDE in the previous slide with a Laplacian operator is precisely equal to, to our um, continuous time discrete space Laplacian flow. Um, before I leave this example, let me show you another one. A second relevant uh, a PDE is called the wave equation. And the wave equation corresponds to a second time derivative with the same uh, Laplacian operator. And so the wave equation is corresponding to an ordinary differential equation. Now this is the first time that you see this ordinary differential equation. And this ordinary differential equation is a second derivative. And so I will refer to this as an example of a second order Laplacian flow. And, and uh, these are discussed, this type of ODE is discussed in detail in chapter 8. But as a, as a motivation for it, remember, uh, uh, the discretization of the wave equation gives you precisely already an undamped second order Laplacian flow. Okay, at this time, I'm ready to, um, I finished reviewing the examples of the Laplacian flow. And I want to mention that the Laplacian flow is a continuous time ordinary differential equation. And I want to review a couple of basic concepts for linear uh, ODEs so that I can then use them in analyzing the Laplacian flow. So this is almost like the equivalent of what we did in chapter two for discrete time problem, but now we're, we're going to do them for, for continuous time. So a continuous time linear, linear uh, system is uh, described by an equation of this form very simply. And the solution um, can be written, is well known that you can write it by computing the matrix exponential of the matrix A at time t, um, where the matrix exponential is defined by this, uh, by this formula here. So formally, this looks like a Taylor expansion of the scalar exponential function, but here instead, the argument are matrices. And it is well known that this definition is well posed and this series always uh, converges in a strong sense. And so it's a well posed, uh, well posed operation. And by the way, I have uh, prepared, for those of you who don't remember all the details, I have prepared an example in um, an exercise, exercise one, where the properties of the matrix exponential are reviewed. Um, and specifically what's reviewed, let me make this a little bit bigger, is that, okay, this series converges absolutely, so no worries about that. But two things I'm going to use uh, a little bit later in the chapter are, are saying that when the matrix, the argument of the matrix exponential is diagonal, then the matrix exponential is the diagonal of the scalar exponential of each entry. 
And then the second property I'll use is that if two matrices A and B commute, then the matrix exponential of the sum is the product of the matrix exponential and, and the order is, is actually also the permute. So e, e to the A, X A is equal to X B. Other properties have to do that if you, if you, one of the reasons why the matrix exponential is useful is that, again, it commutes when you're doing similarity transformation. So you can put a matrix in Jordan form and take the exponential of the Jordan blocks and you will be fine. And remember that the, the matrix exponential always commutes with, uh, with the matrix um, itself. So if you have a, a derivative, this, this is also so obvious that, well, in any case, this, this property is also very useful. So if you are taking a, uh, the derivative of the matrix exponential, you can write this uh, in um, in both as a x a t or as x a t a. So you can you can take the term come out, uh, make the term come out uh, either on the left or on the right. Perfect. Um, now let me go back to um, what I was discussing here which is to say that we've, we've seen how the solution for a continuous time can be defined. And notice that I will give simple definitions, just like we did in discrete time, that my system is convergent when the limit of the matrix exponential is zero. Another, another synonym for, for more than for the system, but rather for the matrix. The matrix is Hurwitz when, when that happens, and it's we'll see it in a second what does that mean for the eigenvalues of a but the case that we are especially interested in this class is the case of semi-convergence whereby the limit of the matrix exponential when time goes to infinity exists but it's not necessarily zero and the other the other quantity that you want to generalize is is the spectral radius remember in discrete time when you look at stability properties whether the eigenvalues have magnitude less than one or greater than one is very critical and people define the spectral radius. In continuous time, what plays a key role is the spectral assist of the matrix, which is the maximum real part of the eigenvalues of A. And so here I wrote a little equation. I, I'll use the symbol alpha of A to denote, take all the eigenvalues of A, take the real part of all the eigenvalues and take the rightmost, the one that is the largest. And now the classic theorem for convergence and semi-convergence in continuous time can be given. I have set up all of the notation. The one that is typical in, uh, in controls and whenever you're interested in showing that the error goes to zero is that the, system, the, the, the matrix is continuous time convergent or Hurwitz if and only if alpha is negative, which means that the maximum real part of the eigenvalues is negative which means that all of the eigenvalues have strictly negative real part. That's what it means for a matrix to be Hurwitz. And the little picture is always the same. You draw, you draw the, you draw the X, the, you know, the complex plane, uh, you put all of the, you, you draw the spectrum of the matrix A and uh, the matrix A is, um, is Hurwitz if all of the eigenvalues are precisely on the left. No eigenvalue on the imaginary axis. However, as we said, we are interested in precisely in the other case. We're interested in the case where uh, I want to determine semi-convergence. And I'll give you if and only if condition, assuming that my system is semi-convergent and not convergent. Hmm? So what does it mean that I have a semi-convergent, not convergent? So it converges to something different from zero. Well, just like in the discrete time case, if you go back and look at the convergence theorem in discrete time, there are three conditions, zero, is an eigenvalue. As an eigenvalue, it is semi-simple. And all other eigenvalues have strictly negative real part. So in discrete time, we would say the dominant eigenvalue is strictly dominant. And here it's also true, zero strictly dominant in the sense that all of the other eigenvalues have real part that is strictly less than the real part of zero, which is zero, of course. Now, I'm going to skip, I'm not going to present the proof of this theorem, but I will say it's based on precisely the same steps as in the discrete time. And that has to do with um, uh, constructing the Jordan normal form, writing the matrix through a similarity transformation, computing the matrix exponential of the Jordan blocks, and, and 
thinking carefully about what happens to each type of block that might occur in the matrix and seeing which ones you can tolerate. And you can tolerate those blocks that for, for, uh, for convergence, you want all the blocks to have um, um, eigenvalues that have strictly negative real part. For semi-convergence, you want the existence of an arbitrary number of blocks of size one with eigenvalue equal to zero. So zero has to have, has to be semi-simple as we said. I'm now ready to um, uh, discuss and analyze the Laplacian flow. We've reviewed many examples. We've reviewed the properties of continuous time linear ODEs, the matrix exponential. Now we wish to study the Laplacian flow, which uh, given I will do it in the case of a generic case of a weighted digraph of order n with Laplacian L and it's x dot equal to minus LX. So that's fine so far. And just for the record, let's just see it in components. It's a precisely um, x dot equal to the summation of xj minus xi, summed over aij. And you, you can sum it over either all n, thinking that aij can be zero, or you restrict your attention to just an out neighbors of node i. So intuitively here, the dynamics is one whereby uh, you know a node i is looking at the values of all of its neighbors, J1, J2, J3, and um, tries to change its own value, perceives an attraction to the values of its neighbors. That's what, that's what each of this uh, term gives you. And the attraction is modulated by this positive coefficients, uh, AIJ. Now, as we said, now we need to do one plus one. Uh, on one hand, we just saw that to understand linear continuous time ODEs, we need to study the uh, matrix exponential. And on the other, we said we're very interested in the case where the matrix itself is of the form minus L. Well, then what we need to study clearly is the exponential of minus L, this, this matrix. What are the properties of, of this matrix? Well, it's a continuous time averaging system but I know that the solution is X minus T L. So this is also corresponding to, this is corresponding to um, the, you know, flowing, which is to say, let the ordinary differential equation uh, flow, execute itself for unit time. So in other words, clearly X at time one, it's equal to X of minus L times X at time zero. So now, intuitively, we just discussed that this is a continuous time averaging. Now I do a step of length one. What matrix do I hope to have in there? I hope for this matrix to be row stochastic. I hope for this matrix to be akin to a matrix A, which is non-negative, and that satisfies A1n equal to 1n, right? This is what we studied in the first five chapter. So it would make sense if this was the case. Is it true that as I take the matrix exponential, I'm essentially going back to um, a discrete time averaging problem. And so what this, this is precisely what this theorem establishes together with more, more with several related properties. So um, let me just tell you what happens to be the case. So as we've done other times, let's L max denote the largest diagonal entry of the Laplacian matrix L. It's kind of a useful quantity. It appears every once in a while. I, I can show five useful properties for you. So let's review what they are. No matter what kind of graph you have, the exponential of minus L is always greater than or equal to e to the minus L max, which multiplies the matrix of zeros. So this, this, is, um, this is the matrix of zero. Sometimes I also have written it like that. So now what that means is that, yes, it is true that um, um, e, the exponential of minus L is a non-negative matrix. Moreover, it also is a non-negative matrix with the property that all of the diagonal entries are strictly positive and lower bounded by, um, by E to the minus L max. So that's the lower bound, right? Very interesting. So it's not true that any row stochastic matrix can be written as the matrix exponential of a Laplace of minus a Laplace matrix because 
if I give you a matrix, a raw stochastic matrix that has zero entry on a diagonal, then you cannot capture that. But other than that, there is hope. The second property is just to confirm the first. The first one is non-negativity. The second is unit row sums. So um, it will be an immediate consequence of the fact that because L1n is zero, it, this will imply, as you will see in the proof in a minute, that that's the exponential of minus L1n is equal to 1n. And so now this is unit row sum. So it's entirely true because of the consequence of 1 and 2 that um, x to minus L is a row stochastic matrix. So there is a lot of analogy. There are many analogies between discrete time and continuous time. The other three properties that I'm about to show you have to do with uh, uh, they're related to the connectivity properties of the graphs. So I am interested in understanding precisely what happens to the matrix exponential when G is either weight balanced or G possesses a globally reachable node. Let's imagine it is not J or when G is strongly connected, which is also, by the way, that means that L is irreducible. And it turns out that we can give if and only if conditions for each of these uh, each of these properties. What are these conditions? Well, um, G is weight balanced if and only if also X to the minus L of the matrix is is column stochastic. Mm -hmm. And remember that G is weight balanced means that one transpose L is equal to zero. We already showed that in the previous chapter. So the columns of L sum to zero, if and only if the columns of the exp of minus L have unit row sum. And we are in the weight balanced case. This is exactly what we call weight balanced even for, for, for an adjacency matrix. Unit column sums. A, a node is globally reachable, the jth node is globally reachable, if and only if, uh, as you recall, the sum of the power of the adjacency matrix has a strictly positive column. And now this is the same. This is saying that um, x minus L of Ej is strictly positive. So the jth column x to the minus L is positive. Finally, the graph is strongly connected if and only if the matrix exponential is a strictly positive matrix, strictly positive. So let me let me mention here what's happening is that as soon as the ordinary differential equation starts to flow and for sure, certainly at time one, you are summing an infinite number of powers of L. And as soon as as soon as you move, then all of the connectivity properties of the graph G appear immediately in the matrix exponential. You don't have to take additional powers. Okay. Perfect. So now we have five properties and I would like to give you just a little bit of intuition for how the proof uh, um, turns out to be. And so remember, we need to prove that let's just uh, resummarize it together quickly. We need to prove that um, um, row sums are one, column sums are one. If, uh, if uh, the, um, um, the graph is weight balanced. And then we need to give, uh, we need to show that um, these uh, reachability properties uh, and co these connectivity properties here give you certain columns and or the entire matrix being positive. And also I need to come up with this lower bound. So how do I do that? Let me first prove two and three, and then I'll give you a lower bound that helps you prove one, four, and five. So let's just do it like that. Let's do easy calculations. Let me show you just the easy parts and then the other ones are, are here. So first of all, if you want to show that X minus L times one N is one N, well, um, take the definition of matrix exponential, up, open a parenthesis, plug it in. So this is the matrix exponential definition. You need to put a minus one to the K there for, for the calculations to be correct. And now recall that L one N is equal to zero. And therefore all of those terms go away. And then you have one identity times one N that's one N. And so this proves property two, very simple. Property three, remember it's an if and only if. So how do you show, let's, let's show that if, uh, if the columns of L sum to zero, let's show that the columns of X minus L sum to are sum to one. 
How do I do that? Well, same identical straightforward proof. Plug in the formula for the matrix exponential, and then you apply one end to each of them. One end transpose L vanishes, so you get only the identity, and you have one one end transpose. So one of the two directions truly is elementary. The other direction of the proof requires just a, a little bit of thinking. You use the theorem of fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, it's not particularly difficult, but let me just keep it. So we have proved that, what have we proved? We proved that the, the row sums are always one and the column sums are one if the graph is weight balanced and the converse, I'll, I'll leave it uh, for you to read. Now I need to prove one, four and five. And I'll, rather than do that in detail, let me just show you an, a useful lower bound. And it works like this is the, the fundamental trick to get the proof to work. It works like this. So as we've done other time, take minus L and sum to it a sufficiently large scalar multiple of the identity. So take L max, L max time identity, when you sum that to L and you call that the matrix A, you are guaranteed that the matrix A is non-negative because you just you just set it up that way by, by summing the diagonal entries, which were the ones that could possibly be negative. And you sum something that is at least as large as, as large as the largest entry, so you're fine. So now, okay, now I can rewrite L like, like that. It's, it's just a simple shuffling things around. Notice that A, a identity commutes with identity A. And so I told you a few minutes back that the matrix under these conditions of commutativity, the matrix exponential can be written as the product of the two matrix exponentials. So I'm exponentiating minus L, but minus L is the sum of two matrices which commute. So I can just take the exponential of that non-negative matrix and pre-multiply that by and now I need to take exponential of a diagonal matrix, but the exponential of a diagonal matrix is equal to the diagonal matrix of exponentials. But basically this is equal to L max E to the minus L max, which multiplies identity, which multiplies exp of A sub L. And so the identity matrix goes away. So what have we seen? Uh, and I, I have now here used those two properties from the exercise that I showed you. We have seen very interestingly, let me just write this equation. Oops, this this equation now. And there is a third equality as well, inequality as well. What have we seen? We've seen that this exponential is equal to a scalar positive, possibly very small, because if L max is very large, e to the minus L max is very small, but strictly positive, which then multiplies the exponential of a non-negative matrix. But, but a non-negative matrix, the exponential of a non-negative matrix is clearly the sum of the powers of the matrix. If the matrix is non-negative, any power of the matrix is non-negative. And so when I take this exponential and let's say that I truncate it, let's say that I truncate it, so I just stop it at n minus 1, then when that happens, I have a lower bound. So I have lower bounded the matrix exponential of uh, minus L, by a positive quantity, which multiplies the sum of the first n minus one power of a non-negative matrix. And now that, that is perfect. That is perfect. And that's all I needed. So here, the rest of this, I'm going to let you read. But the first step is trivial. So clearly, this is lower bounded by the first term of the expansion. And so clearly what happens is that the right hand side is non-negative. And moreover, it's, it's just upper, lower bounded by e to the minus l max times identity. And then the other thing is that um, um, you can now remove the k factorial. And when you remove the k factorial, you get exactly the term that you use in the definition of irreducibility and the powers of the, of the adjacency matrix. So the remainder of the proof here are, are arguments that we have seen very carefully in chapter four, and which I will not uh, repeat here for brevity. Perfect. So this theorem uh, of 7.2 is the one that really allows you to make everything work because you develop such a comprehensive and powerful list of equivalences between the matrix exponential of minus L and various properties of the graph and the corresponding adjacency matrices.
So now, as we continue um, this analysis, now we are ready to really analyze the Laplacian flow, which is the differential equation x dot equal to minus Lx. And now it's very clear that if x is of the form alpha 1n, then clearly Lx is zero. So any multiple of the identity vector is zero for the Laplacian. But I want to know if there, is, if there are other equilibria, other, other equilibria for this system. So once again, if, if I select one n, clearly that's an equilibrium. Are there other equilibria? Well, the answer is no, there aren't, um, um, provided the graph contains a globally reachable node. Because if it contains a globally reachable node, then we know that, um, um, what, what have we established? Uh, we've established that if it contains a globally reachable uh, node, then this quantity is, is strictly positive. And so um, that, that corresponding entry needs, needs to vanish. And um, right, the, the, well, let me say it better. So then let me, let me read the correct logic. If, if the graph contains a globally reachable node, then we know that um, uh, the rank of n is minus one. That was the main theorem in chapter, in chapter six. Therefore, the dimension of its kernels is one. And then the final result corresponds from noting that the only solution, therefore, of L1n is zero. Yeah, sorry, this was a little easier than I thought. So to prove the if and only if here, you don't use the a theorem 7.2 that I just showed, you just use the fact that you use the theorem from, from the previous chapter. All right, in summary, the point that I'm making here is that under this connectivity assumption, the only equilibria of the Laplacian flow are again all of the multiples of 1n. So then, um, let me now try to build some more intuition. So we've already said that x dot equal to minus Lx is a continuous version, an infinitesimal limit of, of the discrete time averaging problem, right? Okay, so now um, we've already said that. Let me give just, just a little bit more intuition. Uh, this is related to a remark in the first chapter two entitled the model decomposition of a symmetric matrix. So. Let me just uh, quickly show you what happens. So when a matrix is symmetric, we know it at, has a complete set of, uh, of real eigenvalues, the smallest of one, lambda one is equal to zero. And it, it is endowed also with a complete set of orthonormal, that is to say orthogonal and unit length eigenvectors V1 through Vn. Now, because of the fact that one N is the right eigenvector, uh, of, of the matrix with eigenvalue zero, uh, then the V1 would be one over N. However, let's be careful. When you do this model decomposition, you need to use unit length eigenvectors. So V1 is equal to one N divided by the square root of N so that it has unit length. And now when you do the model decomposition, the key starting point is to take the inner product between each of the eigenvectors VI and the full solution X and call that quantity YI. And now you can see if you left multiply the equation X dot equal to minus X minus LX, you can see that you obtain Y dot equal to minus lambda I YI, where lambda I is the ith eigenvalue. And if you multiply the initial condition, you obtain the initial value for YI at time zero. So again, if you wanna do it, uh, you know, more, more slowly and more carefully, you just really have to think about VI transpose multiplying both the left and the right hand side of X dot and VI transpose multiplying minus LX. Perfect. So now after you do this multiplication, you obtain N decoupled ordinary differential equations that are easily integrable. You can write out the solution and the solutions involved for each of them involves the exponential, the scalar exponential of, of each of the eigenvalues, lambda i multiplied by minus t. And so after simple calculations, just plugging everything back in, one can calculate in closed form the solution for the continuous time Laplacian flow. 
And this solution, actually, let me say, let me do it differently. This solution is the sum of two terms. One is just the first term and then the n minus one following terms. The first term is the one that corresponds to the eigenvalue zero and therefore e to the zero times t is just the number one. So the first term in uh, the first term here does not depend upon does not depend upon time. And it is just the average of the initial condition times the vector one s. And then there are all of the other terms. The other terms are all described by eigenvalues lambda two all the way through lambda n. More accurately, they're e of the, to the minus lambda two t. And, and notice that because lambda two is less than equal than the others, e to the minus lambda two is greater than equal than e to the minus lambda three t, and so forth. So all of the all of these terms are multiplied by an exponentially decaying function of time because the lambdas are positive. And so now, um, assuming the graph is connected, lambda 2 is strictly positive, e to the minus lambda 2 is, 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 is going to zero as time goes to infinity, then we have proved that we achieve average consensus. Or in terms, as we did in, in, uh, in chapter five, or if one were to define the disagreement vector, subtract from x its average, then you get that the disagreement vector decreases to zero precisely with the remaining n minus one modes. So we know it's the same uh, event calculations as before. I'm now ready to show you the main and final theorem of this chapter. And it's the theorem where um, I, uh, we achieve consensus. There it is right here. That's the consensus equation. And we do that for arbitrary Laplacian matrices with a G associated directed graph. And the theorem says that the following three properties are equivalent. Uh, zero is a simple eigenvalue and all of the other eigenvalues have strictly negative real part for minus L. If and only if minus L is semi-convergent in continuous time, so the limit of e to the minus L is one uh, nw transpose, where w transpose is the same as before, it's a non-negative vector, it's normalized to have unit sum, and then what happens is that w transpose is the left eigenvector, I want to say dominant, because it corresponds to the dominant zero eigenvalue of L. And finally, the third property in equivalent is that G contains a globally reachable node. So the, the, the picture is the same, very, very similar picture to theorem. I believe it was numbered 5.2 in, in chapter five, the, the, the consensus theorem uh, for indecomposable or stochastic matrices. Notice here that one difference is that we don't have to worry about a periodicity because for continuous time problem, there always are whenever you compute the exponential of minus LT, the diagonal is strictly positive. So it's as if every node had a self loop and we know that graphs with self loops are out, directed graphs with self loops are automatically aperiodic. Right, and the three, con the three consequences are the same as before. And that is to say that um, the entries of WI is positive if and only if the node is globally reachable. The solution to the Laplacian flow is consensus. And if additionally, the graph is weight balanced, then we know it must be strongly connected and um, it must be strongly connected. It must be true that the left dominant eigenvector is one over n, one n, and the limit is the one whereby we achieve average consensus. Perfect. That's right. So um, here I, I'm saying that this is the continuous time equivalent of the theorem of discrete time averaging, which was actually 5.1, not 5.2. Uh, apologies. And we, it would be possible to write an, an analogous of theorem 5.2, where remember asymptotic disagreement was the title of that theorem. When the graph does not possess a globally reachable node, then there may exist multiple sinks in the condensation and different groups of, um, of individuals reach different final values. And then you, you know, uh, you have, you have convex combination of the values at the sink. I'm, I'm not going to do it here in the interest of, of brevity. And the proof of this theorem is entirely straightforward once you adopt the same um, idea as in that theorem 6.1 that I talked about in the previous chapter. And that is given a Laplacian construct a row stochastic matrix A um, uh, sub L comma epsilon 
And then uh, we have an exercise 6.1 where a number of properties are established going back and forth between L and A. And so I am going to, to skip this proof as well as it really is just a transcription of the proof. You know, one mimics the proof of theorem 5.1. Okay, as last um, um, example in this chapter, allow me to talk to you about a uh, little, little appendix on how do you design weight balance the directed graph. So this is very similar in spirit to an appendix in chapter five where we were saying, how do I design weights? And one could use the equal neighbor model, but then the resulting GCC matrix is not row stochastic. It's row stochastic, but not doubly stochastic. Or one can design the Metropolis Hastings model and when you do that, you get a, a stochastic matrix that is doubly stochastic. Um, imagine I consider the following problem. I give you a, a strongly connected digraph, and it has A. And now I wish to rescale the weights on each edge of G such that the new adjacency matrix is doubly stochastic and the resulting Laplace matrix is weight balanced. Now, the statement here is that I have a directed graph to start with, whereas the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, if you go back and think about it for a few minutes, applies to, to, a, to an undirected topology, to a symmetric adjacency matrix. So to a, you need to be able, you be, the Metropolis-Hastings, the outcome of the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is a adjacency matrix that is symmetric. And so for sure, the, the topology of the matrix must be, must be the binary, a uh, GCC matrix must be symmetric to begin with. Here, I'm allowing myself to use arbitrary digraphs that are strongly connected. Hmm? And so, uh, the, in other words, this is an algorithm that is more general than that. It's like a third algorithmic example after the two that I showed in chapter five. And it's actually, um, very elegant because the correct way of doing it is not to design the adjacency and then you compute the Laplacian, but actually to set up the Laplacian and then a very simple rescaling. I encourage you to read this, uh, this uh, little, uh, well, the definition is straightforward. So here's the answer. Let me just give you the answer. Here's the answer. Take the Laplacian. Let, well, because we know it's strongly connected than the graph, then we know the Laplacian has a unique left dominant so w transpose l it's equal to uh, zero n transpose so that's the left dominant eigenvector and we know that w is positive because the the graph is strongly connected so then here's the algorithm the algorithm says um let's read it from right to left so take the laplacian left multiplied by the diagonal matrix defined by the left dominant eigenvector and then rescale it down just scale everything down by one over L max, the famous L max that it's always the same. It turns out that I'll let you check that you have not added any edges. So L and L bar have the same topology. The weights of L are, are the pattern, the sign pattern has not changed because you're multiplying by non-negative numbers and you obtain precisely the solution you wanted, which is to say that uh, um, 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 one transpose L bar is zero and the same will be true for uh, for the fact that the corresponding matrix uh, a bar um, um, has unit row and unit and unit column sum. All right. This concludes my discussion of this example. And in conclusion, we have gone through this chapter drawing numerous uh, constant analogies with the treatments in the previous chapter for the discrete time case. So really, essentially, there are so many similarities that it's um, a natural extension. Um, importantly, I hope you enjoyed the examples that we've worked out. In chapter one, there was one very nice example, flocking, swarming behavior in, in ecology. Now we've seen one more example from sociology in continuous time from electric circuits and from um, the study of thermodynamics, uh, uh, heat transfer in, in materials, right, in the diffusion PDE. And we have hinted that there also is a wave PDE that we will see in the next chapter. Then I have given to you a review, perhaps you already knew all of this material, having to do with matrix exponential and convergence theorem. 
And then finally, we've executed the work plan, which is to say we've studied the Laplacian flow and established all of the properties. One key theorem was establishing all of the properties of the matrix exponential of a minus Laplacian matrix. Now that was interesting with the five properties. We've also gone over the proof a little bit and it's a careful, a careful application of, 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 of things we know and the properties of the matrix exponential. And then everything followed. And then I also give you a little bit of intuition for another design problem having to do again with a design of, uh, of weights for uh, this time it was for a directed strongly connected topology. With that, thank you very much and I hope to see you uh, for chapter 8.